Well, would you stand, church, as we open our Bibles to John chapter 9. We're going to pick it up in verse 35. Today is June the 7th, 2020. Already, half of the year is gone. We turned the corner, and here we go to the other side of the year. And Lord, help us. I pray that it will be better than the first part. John chapter 9, verse 35, and we are going to read the last verses through 41. And then I'm going to recap for you. So when you sit down again, pretend you have a cappuccino or something. Don't fall asleep on me, but then I'll share and bring you back up to date on, the last, on this last chapter of John. Let's go before the Lord again in prayer. Father God, again, we love you, Lord, for who you are and what you've done in our lives. We were the ones who were spiritually blind, and you removed our blinders, and we saw for the first time a need for you. And Jesus, though it had been long for some of us, though you've been tapping in our hearts for a long time, it was a day that you tapped in our hearts once again and we had the blinders removed. We saw our need for you and we called out to you, Lord, and you answered. You answered, Lord, and you heard our cries and you heard our confessions to you, Lord, and you forgave our sins and we are ever so grateful for that. Lord, as we consider your word, John chapter 9, once again, Lord, especially this last part, Lord, we pray that you would be with us. Help us to grow, Lord, not only us as adults, but our children who are with us once again, Lord. Help us, Lord, help me, Lord, to address them as well, Lord. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. John chapter 9, picking it up in verse 35, God's word says this. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said to him, do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believed, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into, those, into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. And then some of the Pharisees, not all of them, but some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. Church, you may be seated. Our message title is A True Friend. Now raise your hand if you guys have friends. Kids, how many of you guys have friends, right? Adults, how many guys have friends? All right, put your hands down. How many guys have true friends? Before you raise your hand, these are the ones that help you move, like for the fourth time, right? These are the ones that are, you know, hey, man, I ran out of gas. Can you help, right? And they're there for you. These are the ones that say, uh, you say with them, hey, I need your help. Fill in the blank. And they say, you know what? I could go give you a couple hours of my time. Those are true friends. Guess what? Jesus is a true friend, and we're going to see that develop even more as we come to the conclusion of this chapter. But in our last time together, if you may, so that's where you could kick back and say, I didn't hear that. Oh, I did hear that. Is he still starting over? No. I just want to recap for you where we've been, because last week we spoke about Pentecost, right? It was a Sunday that the Lord gave us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon uh, the people for the very first time as a group. But today we want to re remember what we have been uh, studying. So we learned in this ninth chapter that the Pharisees had done, number one, a very horrible, horrible thing. And they're not the, uh, and it's not just John, the author who is writing this, the Apostle John, but the uh, historians write the people, right? You know, there was a lot of people who were really upset with what had happened. And what was this horrible thing that had happened? The church, the leadership of the church had kicked out a fellow who was born blind and now he can see. But because the person that healed him did it on the Sabbath, they said, fool we on this, you know. And they, from that point on, closed their hearts and would dig into their pride and, and they would not uh, acknowledge Jesus as Messiah. So it was a very, very bad thing that happened. Now, Jesus, he was coming out of the temple. 
Some of the Pharisees, again, leadership, wanted to stone him. Would you pray for my leadership that they don't stone me? No, just kidding. But uh, uh, Jesus was coming out of the temple, and as he was going by, he saw a man. And again, we learned that this man was blind from birth. Very important that you understand this, right? Blind from birth. Now, most of us, especially if someone's trying to throw rocks at us, we would have run. Kids, have you ever ran from bullies? Raise your hand. Adults, have you ever driven fast just to get out of uh, crazy drivers out there? Yeah, right? We just try to get out of the way because there are people who want to harm us. So this is Jesus getting out of the way from these guys. And as he's going by, he sees a guy right there. He sees a man right outside. And, and, and most of us would have said, hey, I see him, but I got to get out of here. Ma first, right? But his disciples, they see him. And Jesus is kind of like, gosh, he's checking out this guy. All his life he's been begging for money, right? He was born blind. He's not an adult, we've learned. And uh, he's looking at him, but he's looking at him with compassion, with compassion. And so his 12 boys, his 12 uh, disciples, you know, they see that Jesus is looking at this blind man with a special interest. So they ask him, quote, Rabbi. Rabbi, since you're there looking at this guy, Rabbi, right? Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Who did this? Well, church, well, that's a curious question. Kids, wouldn't you think that's a curious question to ask? The guy's blind. Why would you think he sinned, never seen anything, right? Or his parents, why would you go there, right? Well, I'll tell you what. In this culture... At this time, blindness was to be one of God's worst curse or worst punishment to people when they were sinned, or if they were sinned, right? And so this, they're thinking, well, if, if it's not his parents, right, then they're thinking, could this man possibly have grown up to be one of the worst, most wanted, or something like that type of guy, big time sinner? Was that why he was born blind? And the Lord just decided, you know, before this fellow goes and commits murders and starts doing this stuff, blindness from birth. He's going to be blind. Again, this was the thought, the prevailing thought of the culture at that time and even their leadership. Well, to their surprise, and here is a lesson for all. How many of you guys have heard, you do not judge a book by its cover? Amen? Amen. You do not judge a person who comes into the church by the way they're dressed. You do not pass judgment because someone falls asleep next to you. If they've been working them 24 hours uh, shifts, they're tired. They wanted to come to church, and sometimes, yes, the preacher puts them to sleep. And the other time, it's that they're just tired, man. Give the people a break. So we learn, don't judge the book by its cover. So Jesus surprised them. He surprised them when he said, and to answer their question, quote, neither this man nor his parents sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. So he's looking at the man, and he's saying, born blind. Hmm. I know what they're thinking. But you know what? God, you sent me to do a work, that your works would be revealed So Jesus is thinking about healing this man. He's already putting in his mind, determining in his mind what he is going to do, right? Let me just take a break here. Boys and girls, kids and church, God has a purpose for your life that is good. We need to walk in a faith that that, uh, aligns ourselves with what he has for us. What God had for me in particular to be a pastor and to come out from the L.A. or San Diego area was a good thing. But unless I had walked in his will for me and and heard his little nudges and felt his nudges and responded, I would have never been here. But the Lord does that for us. So when he is nudging you, when he is doing a work for you and you recognize it, not everybody does. But if you recognize it, move in that leading of his spirit. So God knew that he was going to do this work, right? And then Jesus went on and said something. He says, he says I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. What does that mean? 
Jesus doesn't work swing shift or graveyard? No, that's not what it means, right? right? He says, because the night is coming when no one can work. Hmm, church. <clears throat> With this COVID government lockdown, we learned something, right? Specifically, no public church gatherings. What? We just met last week. We can't meet anyone. No more church gatherings. What else did we learn? Can't go to Uncle Joe's funeral. What? We used to go to the funerals. Everybody's gone to funerals in my family, but no, Uncle Joe died. Let it go. Against the law to go see him because you might give the deceased another illness. Who knows? It's crazy management, right? And no more public baptisms, right? We cannot, they told us, you cannot go to Ridgeway State Park. If you go to the beach at Ridgeway State Park, you can stand in the water, you can sit in the water. You can wade in the water, but don't you dare take a breath and try to start swimming. No, nope, that's not allowed. And we say, oh, my gosh, our world is spinning, spinning quicker and quicker out of control. They want you to believe it's the new normal. In other words, it's not going to spin backwards. And we say, it's an ugly new normal, and I'm not going to call it the new normal. I'm praying that we, they will give you your Denny's breakfast and actually put a bottle of ketchup next to you instead of having to get these little packets, and you have to ask for a packet of salt. You have to ask for a packet of ketchup. You have to ask them to sit down and eat with you, I guess. I don't know where it's going to end, but it is just a horrible new normal, but we get it. We are seeing, and then when we read this, once again, when we read I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. We get it, church. What just happened with us with COVID is a wake-up call for all of us. It's a wake-up call. That's why I challenged you last week. If you have a house, a barn, an upper room where you can host a Bible study in the future, should we have to split into home groups, then be praying about it. Be thinking about it. If you can lead a study, right, and you're saying, well, I, I don't know how to lead. I don't know. Do you know how to read? Well, yes. One of my favorite books was See, Spot, Run. Run, 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 right? It's one of my favorite books. I remember that book, right? Then you can read the Bible, and just reading the Scripture is good enough for some of us. Amen? Hearing the Word of God, that does not return void. So it was a wake-up call for us. So as Jesus, in fact, did the work of the Father, God, who sent him, right? He spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the blind man's eyes. Now, think about the blind man, right? He is happy. How could he not be happy? Someone's having a conversation around him. Kids, no one is pushing him, taking his money. So he's thinking, man, they might be even putting more money in my cup. And all of a sudden, he didn't see, probably heard someone spit, but he didn't see Jesus spit on the ground, you're probably saying, thank God he didn't, right? So the next thing he's doing is he's taking that spit, Jesus is, and he's making little clay balls, and he's bringing them, and the next thing a guy does is he feels this little wet mud going into his sockets, right? I want to try that one day with, do I have any volunteers? To, no, Okay. So then Jesus says, right, he just told the disciples, I must do the works of God, him who sent me, sent, first time, right? And then Jesus sent the blind man, right, to a pool of Siloam, which is translated, you're not reading your Bibles? Say it loud. Sent. Look at your Bibles. So you and I would norm normally say something like this, oh, man, no pun intended. I mean, no, understand that. No joke, man. But Jesus did mean it as a pun. Jesus wanted these wise men that need no help. Who are the Pharisees? Can't you see my long robe and my pointy hat, my kiss, my ring? You know, we are the guys. We are the creme de elite, right? And Jesus takes this guy and he says to the guys, as my father sent me, I now sent him. And he went to a pool called Sent. So when the Pharisees are looking into the matter, how, how did you get here? I was sent. No, no, no. I, we didn't say the name of the pool. How did you get here? I was sent. Who sent you? By a man who was sent by the Father. See, Jesus wants these guys to get it. 
Jesus wants everybody to discover who he is, but it's us, us the people who dig in and say, I don't want to get it. I hate your joke. Give me another joke. No, I'm not here to entertain you. I just want to share with you that he didn't mean for this to be a pun that these guys would understand him. So here's the outcome. The blind man was healed. It was a miracle. Church, kids, everybody is celebrating. How many of you guys celebrate when you get a birthday gift? How many of you guys celebrate when you get a Christmas gift? Right? How many of you guys wish you had more stuff? No. Let's not go there. I have a daughter who... Uh, well, during the Christmas time, we start opening our gifts, and daughter number one, Sarah, opens up this box that was wrapped up, and, and she opens it, boots, I got boots, and we're, oh, praise God, he knew you needed boots, because we live in western Colorado now, right? Second daughter, she's the smart one, she looks at her box and says, okay, I bet you I'm going to get boots. So she opens up her box, and sure enough, boots! So, you know, everybody's happy, boots, boots. And then I have a third daughter, pray for her. Right? But even when she was a little girl, she opens up a goofy little package, another little one set for Megan, right? I won't tell you her name. <laughs> Megan, not you, Megan, but my Megan, right? And she opens it up, and it's another gift, but it's not boots because it wasn't big like her first sister, same as her second sister's. So she opened up a package, and she said, how come there's no boots for me? <laughs> and oh, my goodness, right? So some of us, I get it, you're not happy with your gifts, Right? But Jesus had been great to this guy, and he had healed him, and everybody should have been celebrating the gift of sight. But guess what? Not everybody was. There were some people that were sour-faced, right? And they were upset because this man could see, and not so much that, but because the man that healed him did it on the Sabbath. He, as we say, reigned on their parade. And so some concluded, not all the Pharisees, but some of them, the loud ones, that this man who did this miracle on the Sabbath, he must be a sinner. Doesn't see life the way I see it. So they started digging in. And they're not, they don't want to hear from Jesus. Well, as we learned they inter interrogated, they checked out this blind man's story, tried to make him uh, say something that he didn't, not once, not three, but four times, right? To the point where the Pharisees ask him one more time, tell us about this man, tell us how it happened. And he finally says, look, I've been wanting to see the world all my life, and now I get to, and you have me in this courtroom? No, he didn't say that. But he says, why, right? Do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples Right? In church, at this, they, big word, reviled him. What does that mean? Right? It means that they criticized him in an angrily insulting manner. And they said, you are his disciple. You. You are his disciple, whoever healed you. Actually, that's a compliment. Right? But they didn't know that. But we are Moses' disciples. So they cast him out. That is, they excommunicated him. And church, with that, we are now ready for the rest of the scripture. Amen. That was just your warm up, right? Here we go. So, the title again Jesus, a true friend. So, look at verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? What a question. Is that the first question you would ask? Why didn't he ask him, Hey, dude? So they kicked you out, huh? Ah, don't worry, you're not alone. Look at all these pagans out here. They've all been kicked out. No, just kidding. But he doesn't say that, right? He says, do you believe in the Son of God? Come back to that in just a second. Church and kids, I'm going to share with you some things for us to learn from Jesus so that you and I can also be better friends. How many of you guys, hmm, before I ask you the real question, how many of you guys wish you just had better friends? Half of us, right? Just every once in a while. How many of you need to be a better friend to those other friends, right? That's where it's at. So we could pick this up from here. So, again, Jesus heard that the man had been cast out, right? So Jesus went looking for him. How do you know he had been cast out? You think no one's talking? Everybody's talking, did you see what they did? Did you see what the pastors did or what the 
priests did. They kicked out this man. Because why? Because he was blind and they didn't fix him. It was the Lord that healed him and made him. I don't know. And that he did it on the Sabbath. I don't know. But he had been cast out and Jesus went to look for him. So come back to this. Jesus had previously done a big favor for this man who he did not know. They weren't friends yet, but Jesus had seen them. Jesus took an interest on him, in him. So he had done a, a big favor by giving him sight before they were friends. Now, listen, Jesus didn't wait, something to notice, for the man to do something for him in order for he to do something for the blind man. Sometimes we want friends, but we say, you know, I'm not going to be his friend unless he shares with me his lunch. I'm not going to be friends with someone unless he shares with me this or that. Then I'll do something for him. That's not how Jesus did this. Jesus did him a huge favor, and now he's gone to look for him. Then, again, when Jesus heard that the man had been kicked out of the Jewish church, that is the temple, Jesus went to look for him. So Jesus knew that the now seeing man was, first of all, he must have been confused all this time hearing about the priests and the leaders of Israel and how they heard from God and they spoke to the people, but yet how they treated him very, very poorly. So he's confused about that. And he's probably felt betrayed by his own parents. He heard that they came and asked his parents to talk about this guy, and their parents said, hey, uh, we know he's our son, but he's old enough to answer for himself. You, why don't you go question him? So he said, come on, Mom and Dad. I just got my sight, and you can't hang in there for me a little bit? So he probably felt a little bit betrayed by them, that they didn't stick up for him when the religious leaders questioned them about him. So Jesus went to look for him, church and kids, right? That's what true friends do. When they know someone's feeling bad, when they know someone has disappeared and we don't know where they're at, and we hear so much about suicide today, and we hear so much about maybe they're doing this and that, what do true friends do? They text, right? They are going to go ahead and text. They'll old timers call, right? We who are adults, right? And we try to find that person who has had their feelings hurt and even if no one cares for them, nobody wants to be their friends. Guess what? True friends do. We care and we follow the Lord's example and we'll become a friend to those who nobody wants to be friends with. Also, a true friend like Jesus went to find him so that he might encourage him and comfort him. How many of you guys have been encouraged by a friend? It was a friend that really encouraged you. And how many of you guys have been comforted by a friend? I know girls for you. Oh, Johnny went to be with Susie, and he left me all alone. And I don't know why. I can't help it that I snort. <laughs> you know, we don't know, right? But sometimes <coughs> we need the comfort of a friend. Well, guess what? If Jesus went to do this for this man to be a good friend, a true friend, we need to learn from Jesus and Go and encourage and comfort them. Now, church, kid, because this man, now, this is to the best of his ability. He dealt with what he knew. Because he spoke very well, was very brave and bold in the defense of Jesus to the Pharisees. Who did this? Why did you think this? Look, guys, I'm telling you, he, he did this and that. Though he didn't know that it was Jesus at the time, Jesus went to Find him. There's a note for us. Just a little note for us here. Jesus, our Lord, will be sure to stand by his witnesses and stand up for those that stand up for him and his truth and his ways. You need to know that. Jesus will stand up for you if you have been that witness for him. Jesus will stand up for you if you took a punch in the nose for him. Jesus will be with you if you are there for him, his truth and his ways. Now, church, understand this. Our human president, our human teachers, our human dentists and doctors who have done so good for us, and we wanted to let them know, we wanted to let that teacher know how good they were in our lives. Best sixth grade teacher ever. But because they're human and they have to move, we sometimes don't get an opportunity 
or they don't have an opportunity to recognize that you cared for them, that you wrote that sixth grade teacher a letter. I just want to thank you for the best sixth grade ever up until this point. I, was, I, I didn't get it, but now I get it. And I just want to thank you. And you send their letter and it comes back, sorry, the man moved. You would say, ah, oh, he'll never know how much I appreciated them. Why? Because they're human. But guess what? When you do something for Jesus, when you stand up for Jesus, when you share and encourage someone because Jesus has done it for you, Jesus knows that you care. Jesus knows that your big thank yous have gone up. How do we know? Because the Bible has something called da, 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 the book of remembrance. You know that? There is a book of remembrance. And Father God is writing down all these things you have done about Jesus. So that should thrill you for the moment that your love for him and what your, your duty for him or what you do for him does not go unremembered, right? That it is remembered. You should rejoice on that right now. But guess what? We hear in the Bible that the books with an S, certain books are open. One of those books is the books of remembrance, and that book is going to serve as your credit when that day comes. Could you imagine sitting, seating on the, being seated on the Bema seat? Kids, if you don't know this, the Bema seat is you sit down, and the Lord's going to give you, or he's going to judge the work that you've done. Not for punishment. You're already in heaven. Jesus got you in. You didn't get there because you've done a lot of good things, but because you have. You did those two or three things. The Lord rewards his guys. And you might, and he's going to say, hey, you're going to get rewards. You know why? You're going to say, because uh, I read my Bible twice. Uh, that was a good one. That's written here, by the way. Uh, because I helped Mrs. Jones cross the street when she couldn't handle all those bags. That's also a good one. That's here. And so let's say you name five things. And he says, there's more. And you say, Lord, I can't think of any more. Can I get a little help here? Oh, of course you can. Angel, angel, bring the book of remembrance. And they begin to open. When you were in the fifth grade or in the sixth grade, you wrote that letter to your teacher. And you, you thought they never received it. But guess what? A year later, the mailman delivered the letter. And they were encouraged. You remember that little boy that you prayed for when he had been hurt uh, playing dodgeball and got clobbered in the face, thought he was the best kid, and it came to you, you got the ball, and as he turned around, you're already letting go, and he, he did this, he did that, he did this, he jumped, but he didn't move his head very far, pow, and then you prayed for him after, you told me you were sorry, and you asked Jesus to heal his bloody nose, and he did. That little boy came to the Lord later on. In fact, is that boy in the crowd? And somewhere in that crowd, that boy gets up. I'm the guy that you prayed for, that you beat me up with that ball first, but that you prayed for, and I became a Christian because of what you said. You didn't know that? I had no idea, Lord. It's in the book of remembrance. Remember, remember, remember. You stand up for Jesus, he writes it down. You take one in the face for Jesus, he writes it down. You've done something good for someone else out of your, the genuineness of your heart. Lord, write it down. So, yes, there's a book of remembrance. So, church, kids, when Jesus found the man, second part of verse 35, he said to him, do you believe in the Son of God? What a question. What a question. But, church and kids, a true friend is a wise friend. And first of all, may I say to you, if you and I were two flies and we're coming along and Jesus found the guy, ooh, let's get in on this conversation. Zip. We're right there just buzzing. We would have heard a very pleasant conversation, a very good conversation that is going on between Jesus now and this blind man. Very comfortable talk. So Jesus is going to bring him up to speed, as we say, with Israel's Messiah, this man doesn't know at the time, at this time, <coughs> that this is Jesus, that he is the Messiah, that he is the consolation of Israel. They're all awesome titles for Jesus, right? That it is he who is speaking with him. He doesn't know that yet. And church, kids, huh, Jesus will share with this man because this man 
can now see, and he has already gained some knowledge. So if he's gained some knowledge, Jesus is going to take him a step ahead, right? So how do we know that? Well, let's talk about his knowledge. Look at verse 29. I'll read it through 33. This is the man. He has just been opened his eyes, and they're questioning him. And 29 says, we know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, the one who healed him, <coughs> we do not know where he is from. Then the man, the blind man that was blind, answered and said to them, why, this is a marvelous thing, that you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. I mean, come on, is there 21 guys going around in Jerusalem healing guys that were born blind? No, there's only one. And everybody knows who he is. But you say you don't know where he's from, right, that he opened my eyes? Now we know, he continues, that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it's been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. How does he know this? Well, don't you think at five years old, hey, mom, dad, are you guys praying for me? Because I still can't see a darn thing. When he's 10 years old, mom, dad, you know, getting a little peach fuzz here, but what about this healing? You tell me that God's almighty, he split the seas. He fed the people, our forefathers, in the wilderness with bread. I can't see, right? Well, honey, I don't know. Maybe because you were born blind, you know? No one's ever heard of anybody coming and having his sight. Now he's 21. Mom and dad, don't even bother praying. You ain't going to heal me. It's never been heard of that one who was born blind has received his sight. But what is he saying here? He is saying, it's never been heard of. Who's he speaking to? This big, high and mighty Pharisee's leadership, right? This is, this is who he's speaking to. So he says, now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears them. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone has opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, oh, right, he could do nothing. So church... He has some knowledge. And what is Jesus going to do? Let's step it up. Mm -hmm. Let's take it one step farther. Here's a truth that we all should know. Knowledge that we all should know. Jesus said, for whoever has, to him more will be given. Right? Matthew chapter 13, verse 12. Do you get that? If you have a little and you're hanging out with the Lord... God's going to give you more. It should be our goal to grow as knowledgeable as we can in the things of God. But because you have a little, if you're hanging out, he's going to give you more. Why do you think there's three dots behind this? Given, right? Because there's more to that verse. What does it mean? What does it say? That those who have and do not use it for the Lord, the same will be taken away. How do I apply that? Well, let me ask you. Let me ask you. First, let me give you an example. When we were growing, we came out of the, uh, back in 1996, we came out of the city council chambers and rented Columbine Middle School. We were growing in an auditorium. And we were a group about maybe less, half of this size, but we were growing, right? And uh, it was a great time for us. And, and here comes this family. And this family came from the Baptist church. And we just want to, we heard that you guys teach the Bible. You teach through the Bible. We are so happy with you. Listen, we have been superintendents. We have been Sunday school teachers. We have done this. We have done that. And, of course, every pastor is saying, all right, fresh blood. No, just kidding. But we're, we're happy that this family is here. And at the end of the sentence, after telling me everything they've done for the Lord, they say, but now we feel we need a break for the first year, for the second year. For well, the 10th year, I don't know when they disappeared, but they left, you know, after a while. But come on, man. If you are here right now and you play an instrument, why aren't you, why aren't you playing? If you are here right now and have taught Sunday school and, and taught a Bible study, why aren't you teaching that now? We don't have a Calvary Chapel in Olathe. We don't have one in Kelowna. We don't have one in Ridgeway. We don't have one in Delta. We're, we're not here about mega churches. We are here to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And so if God has put something in your heart, we are here to back you up to do what we can for you. But if you do nothing, dot, 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 that which you do have or you had, the same will be taken away. 
you are to be using what God has given you for his honor and his glory. And you say, well, I'm not a dynamic teacher. Neither am I. I'm a dud. That's why I read the Bible. Because that's the promise that his word does not return void. Oh, Pastor, that was a great message. Yeah, I know who gave it to you. You read the word. That's who's giving you the word. The point is, show up for duty and let the Holy Spirit take it from there. Trust him. Step by faith, right? So we learn something. Jesus said, for whoever has, to him more will be given. And so to this guy, he's going to pour it out. So Jesus begins by asking him, do you believe in the Son of God? It's a question mark. In other words, do you give credit to the promise of Messiah? Do you believe in your heart? Remember this before, the guy doesn't know who he's talking to, before Jesus has come on the scene. Do you believe that Messiah is coming, right? Do you expect his coming? Are you ready to receive and embrace him when he shows himself to you? Are you going to be ready for that? Church, kids, this was the faith, this was the faith of the Son of God by which people in the Old Testament live by. They live by that, right? They lived that Jesus would clearly come and show himself. So two things to note from this verse. Note that the Messiah is here called the Son of God. Why? Could have called him Son of David. They could have called him, you know, something else, right? Another title for him. But why son of God? You know why? It's not just coincidence, right? It's because the Jews learned to call him that from the prophecies of old. Psalms 2, verse 7. Psalms 89, verse 27. And here's something else. In the first chapter of this gospel of John, right, it was Nathaniel that answered and said to him, quote, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. That is, end quote, you are the Messiah. They were trained. They knew that this would be his title. That's why we have it here. Second thing to observe or to note from this verse is the desires and expectations, again, of the Old Testament believers had been guided and grounded upon the promise where they were graciously interpreted and accepted as their believing on the Son of God. If they believed it, if they were there, they were there. So church and kids, right? This is the faith that Jesus is here in verse 35. He's looking for it. Hey, man, I know you're healed, but I want to talk to you. Do you believe in the Son of God, right? What's he going to say? What's he going to say? Of course he does, right? I know for sure. Church and kids know for sure that today's question is still the same. Do you believe in the Son of God? Believing is the great thing required for us now while we're alive. But guess what? When we die, the most important thing that will be inquired about us is our believing on the Son of God. And by this, we must stand or fall forever, forever. Could you imagine this? You close your eyes. Angels take you up, right? Absent in bodies to be present with the Lord. Angels having a conversation on the way up. I don't know why, but maybe it's going to happen, right? Hey, man, what do you think? Well, you know, well, was he or was he not? Well, you know, I think he was. I think he was. That's not good enough to get there. I think I was a Christian. What do you say? Nope. Next. Right? Do you believe in the Son of God? Important now? Phew, more important when we leave this earth because that's what's going to be inquired of us. And by this, we must fall or stand. Now, church, our prayer is that every one of you, kids, our prayer is that every one of you believe in the Son of God. And if, as of today, you have not told Jesus that you believe in him, in just a few minutes we are going to lead a prayer speaking to God, and we're going to ask you to go ahead and pray along with this prayer, asking Jesus to be, come into your heart. Now, church and kids, when Jesus asked the question, do you believe in the Son of God, verse 36, he answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And why would he say that, right? 
Some believe that even now the man didn't know who Jesus was. Or perhaps the man thought that Jesus was just a servant of the Messiah. So he addressed him as Lord, right? And he knew that Messiah must be around. Jesus is asking me, maybe he's going to, this guy named Jesus will take me and introduce me to him, right? Where is he? He says, where is he, Lord? Tell me that I may believe in him. Church and kids, right? But how could he believe in one whom he had not heard? I have an application for us from verse 36. Our work as Christians, be it adults or you kids, even you, this is your work, is to tell others who the Son of God is that one may believe on him. It's our work. It's what God has called us to do, whether we're older or we're just the kids, right? 37, and Jesus said to him, get this, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Could you imagine the Lord saying that to us? Ah, right? So church, kid, think about this. This man who was born blind and now sees not only has received his bodily sight, but now with his eyes, he sees Jesus, and Jesus introduces himself as the Messiah, right? How can one contain themselves? Very difficult, I'm sure. He didn't have to go far, though, to meet God, did he? And so the Bible states, behold, the word is near you, right? Remember John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, right? And the word um, is God, right? So it's near you, always near, near you. Interesting is the fact that Jesus didn't reveal himself to others. He didn't say this to everyone else other than unto this man and the woman of Samaria. He said to her, quote, I that speak to you am he. So we know two people that he has revealed himself directly to. He let the others figure it out, right? He healed one guy's arm, right? He did these other miracles all the time. What do you think? What do you think? He wanted people to think on him, remember what the scriptures had said in the past, what they were taught, and to figure it out themselves. Right? But not so to these guys, right? To these two and foolish, weak and foolish things, according to the world, they were weak and foolish, but not to Jesus, right? He chose to make himself known to them. It's not true. For the wise and the prudent. Verse 38. Then he said, Lord, I believed. And he worshiped him. Church, kids, right? The man was surprised and full of wonder at this revelation of Jesus. Thus he said, I believe and worship. <laughs> he professed his faith in Christ. Lord, I believe you to be the son of God. And so he paid homage, or that means Big fancy word for public, publicly gave Jesus special respect. He worshiped him. And church, kids, we know that none but God is to be worshiped. None but God. And so worshiping, G and so by in worshiping Jesus, this man acknowledged him to be God. 39, verse 39. And Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see may see and that those who see may be blind. Well, what do you mean that I came that those who do not see may see? Well, certainly this blind man couldn't see, but now he can. But then again, you and I couldn't see. You and I might have been religious people, but the Lord wants to give us spiritual sight so that we see a need for him. And that those who may see may be made blind. There's always people say, <coughs> excuse me, there's always people who say, you know what? I've been studying this for years. You've got nothing to tell me. You know what? I don't believe in Jesus. I'm a priest. I didn't have to believe in him, right? It's crazy. So church, here are two things. Number one, Jesus said that for judgment I have come into this world. Jesus did not come into the world to execute judgment, but nevertheless, the inevitable results of his coming is judgment. Why? Because there are people who refuse to believe. And as the light of the world, Jesus came that the blind, so that the blind might see. Secondly, those who think they can't see, they're going to be made blind, or they'll stay blind, spiritual blind, that is. 40. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, are we blind also? What, what kind of an answer do you think he should give them? What kind of an answer do you expect? 
Well, duh, right? But you know, Jesus doesn't say that. But you kind of expect a negative answer. They say, are we blind also? Church, kids, the Pharisees who were there were not there to congratulate the man who was once blind on his now being able to see. No, they were there to find something, anything wrong with what Jesus was saying. They were troublemakers. They were sin sniffers, right? You guys ever seen those sin-sniffing dogs? Right? They're, they're around, I'm telling you. Well, anyway, that's what they were there. So they hearing Jesus, they knew that he was referring to them being blind. So they asked him, are we blind also? First part of verse 41, Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. Now some people take this, oh, that means that we could be sinless. No, 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 that's not what he's talking about. It, Jesus is saying to them, if you really didn't understand, you wouldn't be held responsible, right? If you didn't really understand that only God can take a man being born blind and give him his, give him his sight, if you didn't understand that, all right, we get it, right? If you really didn't understand that it would be God's son, as the prophets had revealed, that would manifest himself among them as the Messiah doing such miracles then it would be as if you had no sin, no sin as bad as refusing to believe what they were seeing and happening. You see, they saw it. They saw these things, but they refused to believe, right? So 41, second part says, but now you say we see. Therefore, because you say, no, 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 I don't need it. I get it. Don't help me. I got it, right? Therefore, your sin remains. So church, kids, the Pharisees were being stubborn. That's the bottom line. They were being stubborn. For if they wanted to, if they softened their hearts, they could have admitted that they were wrong, right? They could have admitted that, you know what? It's true. Only God can heal a man who was born blind, right? And so you must be his son, the Messiah. You were right. He was right in front of them. Indeed, he was the Messiah, but they didn't do this. And like the man who now could see, they could have even fallen on their knees and begged God, begged Jesus. You know what, Jesus? Man, we've been a bunch of louses. We should have recognized this. We know what the scriptures say. Could you forgive us? Allow us to worship you. But they didn't. They dug in, right? And though they could see, they dug in because they felt that their way was the only way. They didn't need anybody to help or guide them. They especially didn't want Jesus to be their teacher. So Jesus said to them, therefore, your sins remain. As we close here for today, right, we have learned a few key things, right? Let me just share two. Number one is that we have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he is the only one that can cure our natural spiritual blindness. Why do I say natural? Well, you don't remember this, but when you were two years old, you screamed, you yelled, you were horrible to your parents, you didn't do what they said, you fought them all the time, wouldn't eat your food, throw it up all over the place, right? And you stole someone's toy, right? When you were five, six, and seven, you did some dumb things, right? And you can see your need for the Lord. We are born spiritually blind. And sometimes we don't come to the Lord till after we're 13 and 14. I was stealing my first bikes when I was 14 years old, right? Knew that it was wrong, but that's what everybody did, right? So we spiritually were blind. And so we need to ask the Lord, Lord, remove my spiritual blindness that I might see a need for you to save me. Lord, I don't want to grow up and have a hard heart and be like these Pharisees. I don't need anybody. I'm going to heaven because I belong to the boys club called the Pharisees. We're the Sanhedrin. We wear shirts that have a monogram S on it. It's not stupid, I think, or something, but that's what they had, right? And they didn't felt like they didn't need that. We don't want to be there, right? So, again, if you, the second thing we learn is that one doesn't, need Jesus or anybody else to guide them about God or even how to get to heaven, they are truly blind. Therefore, their sins remain. Now, if you have not told Jesus, kids, you guys and adults, if you have not told Jesus that you believe in him, 
If you have not told Jesus that you want to see spiritually, if you have not told Jesus that you're sorry for your sins and ask him to forgive you of all of them, if you have not told Jesus that you want him to be your Lord and your Savior and your true friend, remember Jesus is a true friend, then I would like to lead you to a prayer right now. I'd like to lead you in a prayer right now, asking Jesus to be all that we talked about. So would you bow your heads? And church, this goes for you adults as well. Let's bow our heads and ask the Lord uh, the following. Lord Jesus, first of all, we want to say to you that we believe in you. And Lord, we want to say to you that we want to see spiritually. We want to see what you have for us. And, Lord, we want to say to you that we are sorry. Jesus, we are sorry for our sins, and we ask you to forgive us even now. And, Lord, we want to say to you and ask you to be our Savior, and from this point onward, be our true friend. And we ask, Lord, these things in your name. We, we're just going to be believing that you hear our prayers, that you heard my heart right now whisper and say to you that we need you. And we thank you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.